Hi, everyone. My name is Christopher Cata with Caregiving Matters. Today, we're hosting a digital event about aging in place. Aging in place is all about being empowered to live wherever you choose with dignity and independence by being safe, healthy, and socially engaged. As a senior, do you think about aging in place? Do you think about ways to improve your life today so you can continue to age in place for years to come? Being mindful of how you live, where you live, and with whom you socialize with have direct impacts on your health, happiness, independence, and your dignity. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Susan Hyatt of Silver Sherpa, who's speaking with us today about starting your own smart aging plan. Thanks, Christopher. Appreciate the introduction and delighted to be here. Always delighted to work with Caregiving Matters. We've done uh, many sessions with Caregiving Matters before, and I'm delighted to talk today about uh, starting and building your own smart aging plan. So I'll ask Christopher to move to the first slide. And this is just to set the stage for us. As Christopher said, the, the uh, work that we're doing today is talking about aging in place. And we're in the middle of a longevity revolution in Canada, and in fact, around the globe in many countries. And baby boomers are redefining how we age and the aging landscape. And so, uh, and I'm a baby boomer too. So we're demanding products and services so that we can live empowered lives and fulfilling lives right to the end of life. Uh, so our goal, if you speak to many of our clients and we work with people of all ages and stages, but many of our baby boomer clients, uh, what is their goal? Well, it's to stay in their own home as long as they can. And I think the, the important things that Mary has raised in her work on uh, this series of podcasts is that we want to have choice. And what does that mean? Well, choice means what are my options? I don't want someone to tell me what to do. I want to look at my options and decide for myself. So I want to have choice. Um, dignity is another important theme because dignity means I want to be valued and respected as I get older and as I age in place. And then the third theme is independence. So what does that mean? Well, it means I want to be in control of my life and the decisions I make for as long as possible. So how do we, the big question now is, so how do we empower ourselves to do this? Because there's a lot of articles and there's a lot of talk about aging in place, but let's move to the action. How do we actually do this? How do we empower ourselves to do this? So let's look at the next slide. So this is um, a favorite diagram that we use with clients at Silver Sherpa, and it's called the maze. And this was a diagram that in we've been in business over a decade and we've helped hundreds of families. And when families call us for help, they might be in a crisis or they might be in a planning stage, but invariably they say, you know, we're overwhelmed with all of these decisions and it feels like we're in a maze and so we've asked people in ver at various times to draw us pictures of how they felt and invariably they'll take a, a pen and they'll draw on the back of an envelope and this is what they draw so if you start on the left hand side often what happens with us as we get older and as we start to um age is that we may have an interaction with the healthcare system. And it may be because of a health issue, perhaps a fall and a fracture, something. So we go into the healthcare system. And it may be that the result of that experience is that you can't go home for a while, or you need to go to rehabilitation or you need to go to respite care of some sort to recuperate 
uh, especially if you don't have someone at home that can look after you and can and be your caregiver. And so then you start into the maze of, well, if I can't go home alone, can I get home care? That's down in the left-hand side. Well, but if I look at home care, publicly funded home care is, is um, not a, a given in our system, particularly in Ontario. And it doesn't mean that you're going to get as much home care as you really need. So you might be able to get a few hours a week from the publicly funded system, but it may be that you have to have private home care to top it up. Well, that costs money and it costs a lot of money these days. And so that's where you end up talking to your financial advisors because you say, well, gee, if I'm going to go home and I need home care, this is going to cost X amount of money. Or perhaps your family is saying, well, why don't you go to retirement living for respite care, just go to a retirement community to get back on your feet, and then you can go home. But again, those things cost money. So you can see where all of these factors start to overwhelm people, and they start to think, oh my goodness, how am I going to figure this all out? The next slide, please, Chris, that gives us an opportunity to say, well, what's the approach that we want to take? And here's our approach at Silver Sherpa. And this is based on a decade of research and working in many different countries around the world. So what it all boils down to from our perspective is that if we're going to age smartly, there are nine quality of life factors that we need to think about, we need to assess, and we need to factor into our smart aging plan. So if you start up at the top, physical health and wellness, most people think, oh, yes, well, my medical issues and my health issues, that's, that all is, is going to be there. Um, that's fine. But you want all of this documented. You want all of it written down. But there are lots of other wellness factors that have nothing to do with doctors. You may go to a massage therapist. You may go to a reflexologist. You may... Um, see a podiatrist for foot care. These are all factors that you want built into your plan. Dental care, for example, is very important. So it's not just about doctors and hospitals. Um, the second factor, if we go around, is environmental and safety factors. That includes your housing, where you want to live, living at home, what sort of modifications may need to be made to your home as you get older, or perhaps as you begin to have mobility issues. Um, so these are all factors you can go around the wheel here. The important thing is you're in the center with your family, if you wish your family to, to be part of this. And all of these factors need to be taken into consideration, including things like your mental health, social activities and relationships, but notice the two things that are in on the right hand side there that are highlighted in a different color of financial preparedness and legal preparedness. In our work, what has become very clear to us in these smart aging plans is that there's often a lot of focus on a care plan and people talk about elder care and all this care. But the issue is today that care will involve financial considerations and it may involve legal considerations as well. So if you're not able to speak for yourself, then your powers of attorney would be the people who would speak for you. And that's critically important because let's say you go to hospital and you end up um, you have a surgery and you end up after the surgery with delirium and you don't have good cognitive awareness and you're not able to make decisions for yourself. That's when that attorney for personal care becomes critically important. And many people forget that in their planning. We'll talk a little bit about that later. So let's move on to the next slide. So how do you start your own 
smart aging plan. Rule number one, everything needs to be written down. If it's not written down, it doesn't exist as far as the courts are concerned. Should someone decide to uh, argue with your plan? So how do you build your plan? Well, you document your wishes. Again, you must write your plan down. Put all of your documents together in a binder. And then think about who's in your trusted circle for discussion. Now, trusted circle is an interesting concept because it used to be people said, well, I have to talk to my family. Well, to, in today's world, Family means different things to different people. And people who are in your trusted circle are the people you trust to talk about these things, to talk about what does it mean to have a good death? What does it mean to um, have someone other than a family member as an executor? What does it mean if I'm trying to decide who should be my attorney for personal care and make decisions if I can't make decisions for myself around care, around medical decisions, around hygiene and around nutrition and where I live. All of those things fall under the heading of the attorney for personal care. So who's in your trusted circle? And think about it. Some people like to think about this for a while. There are many people who do not want their family members involved or their adult children. Instead, they turn to colleagues or trusted advisors like their minister or perhaps someone that's in their bridge club that they, they've played bridge with for 20 years and they've, they've become very close friends. So identify that trusted circle and then start working through this and think about different scenarios. Okay. And, and this is something at Silver Sherpa, when we're doing planning discussions, we pick a couple of different scenarios that the client might be interested in talking through. So for example, if I were to have a serious stroke tomorrow, and I could not speak for myself, who would I want to speak for me as my attorney? And what would I want them to know about me and my wishes? So that's what we mean by different scenarios. Um, so let's talk about these three doors. We think about uh, smart aging as a three-legged stool. Um, if you think of it that way, or three doors to walk through. The first one being financial considerations. And often we think, oh, well, we'll put that as, you know, health and well-being should go first and then financial second. But in working with many, many older people, they have said categorically, the majority of people, absolutely, you talk about the financial situation first, and then go on to health and well being. And the reason is that a lot of couples as they get older, you know, the, um, we often will have the um, husband say, if anything happens to me, I'm really worried about the financial affairs, because my wife doesn't, or my partner doesn't pay a lot of attention to that. I've always looked after that. So that's why we put financial considerations first, because we've been told to by clients that that's number one, then health and well-being. Then the third door we're going to walk through is legal preparedness. And I'm going to give you some highlights so that you can start uh, building your plan and writing this down. So we'll go to the next slide. So back to those key people conversations and you've got your trusted circle. Now we're going to walk through door number one. And that's a picture of one of those gorgeous Dublin doors um, that I took when I was in Dublin. It's I've done quite a bit of work in many different countries and Ireland was one of my favorites. So um, the Dublin doors appealed to me. So that first door, financial preparedness, 
what kinds of things should be in your uh, smart aging plan, in your binder? Well, you're going to want your overall financial plan in there. If you're working with an advisor, ask them for one page of your financial plan. This is your binder. Um, it's your information, but you want to be able to see that one page. Um, and in there, you're going to talk about assets and what types of assets you have. Assets might be your cars, your, your property, your uh, home in Florida, for example, your home in Toronto. Assets could be um, pieces of art that you have or an art collection. Anything that has monetary value is an asset. And then your liabilities. What do you owe? Do you have a mortgage on a property? You want to make sure that's documented. Do you have lines of credit that um, are available to you? Make sure you've got those documented. You don't need to put the numbers and the passwords, but you need to document and where they are. If there are outstanding loans um, that you have, if there are credit card loans that you have, you want to make sure that you've got all of that documented so that if something happened to you, then your power of attorney for property could see that and would know where to start. Uh, a, really, a realistic budget is also important because as we move forward, um, there are budgets probably, you've laid out a budget for the year and it becomes really important because if you require care and that care is costly, let's say it's private care, you want to understand what the implications are for your normal budget. And then your financial advisor, you want to alert them that if you require those care costs, there's going to be um, a change to your financial plan. So care costs are very important to anticipate. Let me give you some numbers. We have a client that's here in the West GTA, and he wanted to uh, pass away at home. That's possible to do. Um, and we certainly do this with our clients, but it requires a lot of extra staffing. It requires modifications to the home, equipment rentals, et cetera. So you have to set up the team around the individual. The care costs for a month at home with additional care ran to about $28,000 or $30,000. That was to be in the home with private care 24 hours a day with additional uh, equipment, additional people coming in, doctor's visits, etc. So these care costs can re they can rise very quickly depending on what your needs are. So if you're looking at options, you always want to cost them out. Home modifications, if we're uh, staying in our own homes, and let's say we run into mobility issues. Um, being in a two-story house, like I am, is not helpful if you've got mobility issues, if you can't get up and down the stairs, especially if the bedrooms are all on the second floor. So modifications, if you're thinking ahead, you're planning ahead, well, some people have said to me, well, I want to put an elevator in my home. And there are now some... Uh, very cost efficient types of elevators that are coming on the market. That might be an option. Other people might look at um, stair. Um, I think you've probably seen some of the stair lifts that can be um, put into the home. But again, these are modifications. They cost money to make those modifications and they're all part of the planning. Another thing to think about in financial preparedness is tax planning. We're really surprised at the number of people who do not do tax planning. And it is critically important. And you need to start when you're younger to think about tax planning. And for clients who have wealth managers, 
the wealth managers usually go into tax planning with their clients fairly early on. But tax planning is something that is critically important for clients as you get older. There are other credits and um, disability tax credits that can be used and can, there are a whole myriad of um, tax credits for people staying in their home. But again, these change regularly. You need to have someone who has the expertise to help you with this. And there are all sorts of obligations. For example, if you're going to get a disability tax credit, um, if someone becomes disabled, it's a valuable tax credit. It can be up to almost, I think this year, it's um, a credit of about $8,800 against taxable income. But there's a very strict process that you have to go through in order to get a disability tax credit for an individual and a certificate from uh, CRA. And so those are just a, a few of the myriad of things around financial preparedness, but this is a good start if you're building your own plan. Uh, the next slide, please. Let's go to door number two. And door number two is, remember we were talking about health and well-being? Well, I've also added a good death. So none of us are getting out of here alive. We're all on a journey. And it's at some point in your life, you want to think about as you, as you age, what does a good death mean to me? Where do I want to live? If I can no longer live in my own home, because I want to be there as long as possible. But let's say it just becomes overwhelming. Um, I don't have my partner any longer. And I want to move closer to one of my children. Uh, then, and I may be not in good health. So what does that mean? Does it mean you want to live with your children? Do you want to live in a multi-generational household? If you're not well, and um, let's say you've been diagnosed with a, a terminal disease, what does that mean? What do you want? Where do you want to be? Uh, so that end of life planning is important. And it's important to think about it. Nobody ever wants to talk about it. But at Silver Sherpa, we, we approach this topic with humor and grace. And we want people to think about this because you don't want to leave your family in a situation where something happens. You're in an accident and they have no idea what your burial wishes are. And the family splits down the, the middle well, mom wants to be cremated. No, mom did not want to be cremated. Mom wanted to be buried. Well, you can't do both. So somebody has to decide. So if you want to empower your, your own family and you feel empowered yourself, write these things down. Put it as part of your plan. And of course, there's the good things like the quality of life factors, good nutrition, social interaction, mental health, Think about all of those things. Um, think about what's good for your mental health. Um, another point to consider now, and we all know that the terrible strain and stress our healthcare uh, systems are under since the pandemic and the ongoing pandemic that we're experiencing. It's really important to have a responsive primary care team. And primary care team can include all sorts of health advisors, not just a doctor, it could be a nurse practitioner, it could be your family doctor, it could be a physical therapist, it might be a dietitian. But who is that team that you need to support you and guide you um, in your uh, to be as healthy as you possibly can? And you want them to be responsive. You don't want them to say, if you need, if you're not feeling well, you want to be able to get an appointment, not be told, oh, well, we can't see you for three months and then it needs to be on Zoom. That's not a responsive primary care team. So you need to think about who are these people you want around you. 
um, and document who they are, what their numbers are, what their emails are, who do you phone, how does this happen? And then another point, and this certainly is not an exhaustive list, I'm just trying to provoke some ideas, but a safe home environment. So where can you live safely as long as you wish? And safety is a big factor. One of the things that I'm sure if you've uh, worked with family members or you have older people in your family and uh, perhaps it's uh, dad's living on his own and he's living in the country and his daughter or his son is really concerned about him because he's had the odd fall um, and they're trying to get him to wear uh, a pendant which is a healthcare connect pendant, which connects to an emergency service. And this is something that many people say, oh, I don't want to wear that. However, it's a valuable tool. And there are many more of these uh, services and products that are coming into the marketplace, because as we want to stay in our homes longer, we may need a bit of technology to help us out. And if we fall, it may be very helpful to have the Fitbit or the uh, pendant on my wrist tuned to a potential fall where I can have an automatic video link to someone who's monitoring the situation. So all of these things are changing. There are more products and services coming in every day. And it's a, it's a big topic, but one that's worth thinking about and putting into your plan. Now let's go through door number three. Legal preparedness, a uh, big topic. So you want to be sure that you have an updated will. You want to be sure that you have a, a power of attorney for personal care and a power of attorney for property. So those are the three big documents that you want to be sure that you have. Now, power of attorney for personal care as you move across provinces and territories in Canada, there are different rules in different provinces and territories uh, for different things. So you need to check with an estate planning lawyer in the province that you're living in. But Ontario, for example, we have a power of attorney for personal care and a power of attorney for property. The attorney for personal care is the person, they're called an attorney, that would be um, identified by you. And they, if you cannot make decisions for yourself, then there are a myriad of decisions that they are allowed to make. And that includes healthcare decisions, personal care decisions, what food you eat, where you live, what clothing you wear, etc. So it's a very broad set of powers that that attorney has. And that is engaged if you are, are incapable of making those decisions yourself. Now remember, we talked about care costs, what back on the financial side, it's a very wise thing when you appoint your attorneys to get some agreement on payment of care costs. Because the care costs the are paid by or the responsibility for payment would flow through the attorney for property. So they're looking after all the assets, all the money. So you might be in a situation where your power of attorney for personal care says, oh, it's time to move my, you know, um, Susan needs more personal care and nursing care then we can afford to give her at home. So we want to move to a retirement assisted living community where we can get more concentrated care, but that is going to cost $10,000 per month. So who is in authority to pay those bills? That's the power of attorney for property. So when you're thinking about appointing these people, you want to make sure that they'll work together and that they agree that these are your wishes and this is how you want the care costs paid out. Because what you don't want is the power of attorney for personal care saying, or the attorney for personal care saying, 
it's time to move and the attorney for property is saying, no, I don't want to pay those costs. That sets up a, a legal dispute. The next important thing here that I've put on the list is do the attorneys know your wishes? Some people appoint attorneys and never tell them that they're the attorney. They appoint their oldest child. Well, that's not helpful. And do they know what your wishes are? Because if you don't tell them, if, if it's not documented in a plan and you don't sit down and talk through that plan with them, how would they know? The next thing that's really important to think about is, can your attorney and will your attorney follow your wishes? We've had several situations at Silver Sherpa over the last um, couple of years with the COVID pandemics where um, the uh, family member wanted to look at MAID and they were el eligible for medically assisted uh, death. And the attorney uh, for personal care, the daughter, indicated that in no way would she be agreeable to that. And would she even consider that? Now, you know, it becomes an issue if your attorneys won't follow what your wishes are. So you need to think about this carefully and make sure that not only will the attorneys follow your wishes, but will they work together? Uh, so we've talked about the updated will and the other item in legal preparedness that people always ask about is, who will be your executor? And that's another whole day of a topic unto itself. Um, will you, uh, will a family member be the executor? Will you go to someone with expertise like a trust company? And these are all things that you want to talk through um, with a lawyer who can advise you and give you independent legal advice on this topic. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, so key points to remember, build a written smart aging plan. If it's not written down, it doesn't exist and people can misinterpret your, your wishes. The second thing, share your plan with your power, with your attorneys and family if you wish. But there are many people who don't wish to share their smart aging plans and their details with their family. Um, that's up to you. It is your plan, um, but share it with your attorneys. Make sure your attorneys have copies of their POA document. So if, uh, if I'm, and I am, the attorney for several family members for personal care, I have copies of every single one of them filed in my filing cabinet. So that if one of those family members becomes ill, I have a copy of the power of attorney and I will take that with me. So make sure that your attorneys know that, you're, that, you're, that they are your attorney and that they've got copies of the document. And if you are getting overwhelmed or you're feeling overwhelmed or you're not sure you can walk through this process, then call for expertise to help guide you through the planning process. You can call um, Silver Sherpa. We can help you through this process. Uh, we have a, a service that we call a smart aging audit and plan that works very well at a reasonable cost. So you can certainly call us and talk about that. Or you can call others. There are other people, and I'm sure that Caregiving Matters is going to um, have other podcasts of other individuals that are um, able to work with people on, on um, planning uh, to age in place. The, la uh, the next slide, please, Christopher. So just remember, this is a good, good reminder. Our team uh, talks about this and we use this in our uh, staff meetings a lot. Remember a dream written down with a date becomes a goal. And a goal broken into steps becomes a plan and a plan backed by action, not just talking about it, but action becomes your reality. So 
if you've been thinking about aging in place, but it's just a dream, you've got a few steps to go before it becomes a reality. So we'll go to the next slide. And as one of our wise clients once said, plan ahead on your own terms and make your wishes known. Or if you don't, someone else will plan for you and you may not like what they do. So it's up to you to plan your own destiny. And I think that should take us to questions. And Chris may have a question. Um, and then I'm Chris, I'll ask you just to um, turn it over to the contact details, just in case people are looking uh, before the questions. There's my email and our office number if you have further um, inquiries. And you can certainly follow Silver Sherp on Facebook. We're very active on Facebook. You can get all sorts of information off our website at uh, silversherpa.net and we're also on Twitter and LinkedIn. So Chris, over to you. I think I Thank took so a little much. bit more than I expected. No, that was fantastic, Susan. Thank you so much. Um, I do have two questions and they're related. So it's a two-parter. Um, the first one is, you know, when when is the ideal time to start a smart aging plan? And then the follow-up question is how frequently should people review and update that plan? once they've got it in place? Those are two really good questions. So the first one, uh, when is the ideal, uh, ideal time? Um, from our perspective at Silver Sherpa, Christopher, the ideal time is to start in your 40s or 50s. Why? Because life happens, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We, by the time we're 40 or 50, we've accumulated some wealth. We probably have, we might have kids or dogs or pets or responsibilities of some sort. Um, some of us have big, bigger families. Some of us have smaller families. Uh, we might have property, uh, a home, a mortgage. And all of these things now are important. And uh, for business owners, it's really important because they may not have all their ducks in a row with shareholders agreements or directors agreements or whatever. And so those of us who run businesses have an added layer of complexity. So the ideal time is to start in your 40s or 50s because then you can lay down a baseline for all of these things. Don't wait. Um, a lot of people wait until they're 70 or 80 to build a smart aging plan because they think, oh, it's got aging in it. Um, so I'll wait. Uh, ideal time is 40 or 50. The next ideal time after that is when people are thinking about shifting, um, not working full time, maybe working part time or thinking about retirement. Okay. Absolutely certain you should have one by that time because that's your baseline. But ideally, I would say 40s or 50s. Um, the second thing, how frequently should you update? Um, in our practice, we update the plans every year. Okay. So we, I mentioned that we have this smart aging um, audit pl and plan um, service. So what we do is go through an exercise with our clients. We build out their plans with them working with them. And then we do a complimentary update each year after that. So that we give call them up, say, hi, how are you? How how's the year been? It's the anniversary, um, anything new. And they might say, Oh, yeah, you know, I got COVID. And then I got long COVID. And then I got diabetes. And now I'm on all these drugs. And you say, Okay, that's a good time to update that healthcare medical care section. Um, of your plan. So we update that, send it off to them. They update their binders. So this is an ongoing tidy up kind of process. And it's nice to have somebody sort of call you and say, hey, anything new? Excellent. Good, thank good thank question. you so much, Susan. On behalf of Caregiving Matters and our audience, we want to thank you again for this presentation. It was absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Susan. 
Thank you, Christopher. It was most enjoyable. And I hope everybody does their own, including you, does their (laughs) own smart aging plan today. (laughs) See you again. All right. Thank you. Bye for now.